John chapter 4, let's turn there this morning. John chapter 4, and, and our message is an encounter with Jesus. At the end of chapter 3, you remember that the Pharisees tried to stir up trouble between Jesus' disciples and the disciples of John the Baptist. You remember that? But rather than get, it, get into it with him, Jesus leaves Judea, and he goes back to the area of Galilee, and it's there that Jesus encounters two very different people, both of who end up believing in him, a woman at the well and a nobleman. And I thought to myself, it was more important that Jesus lead these two to faith in him than it was for him to stay back and win an argument. And sometimes and and often our evangelism uh, ends up being just that. It's just an argument. It, it, It sort of disintegrates to that, and we can't let that happen. But beginning in verse 1, we have Jesus and this woman at the well. Therefore, when the Lord, notice that, when Jesus knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples did, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. So he wasn't baptizing, but his disciples were. But remember at the end of chapter 3 that John's disciples had come to him and said, hey, John, Jesus is baptizing uh, more uh, uh, than you are. And I love John's response. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. Jesus, you see, was aware of the storm that was brewing between him and the Pharisees, the religious leaders. And so rather than be used by the Pharisees to stir up trouble, he left Judea. That's where the Pharisees hang out, hung out from in the city of Jerusalem and departed again to Galilee. And so he just leaves the controversy behind him. And that's a good lesson for us to learn. But notice verse 4, but he needed to go through Samaria. So it's not only true that Jesus did not waste his time arguing with the Pharisees, but it's also true that he had a divine appointment awaiting him in Samaria. And I thought to myself, you know, when we're doing what we shouldn't be doing, then we are by default not doing what we ought to be doing. We may miss that divine appointment. Israel at the time was divided into three different geographical regions. You had Judea in the south where Jerusalem was, yeah, Galilee to the north, and then you had Samaria that was right in the middle. And whenever the Jews would travel from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north, uh, they would go straight. Instead of going straight through Samaria, they would not normally go through Samaria. Why? Because the Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans hated the Jews. But Jesus here does something different. He goes right through Samaria, and he does so on purpose. And I thought, aren't you glad that the Lord Jesus came to where we were, that he didn't avoid the kinds of places and people that we were engaged with before we came to him? And aren't you glad that he didn't avoid us? before we met him. But in order to avoid going through Samaria, the Jews would travel east first. They would cross the Jordan River and go straight north. And then once they'd pass Samaria, they would go west on into the Galilee in order to avoid the Samaritans. And the Jews from Jerusalem, they not only looked down on the Jews from Galilee, but they both looked down on the Samaritans because they were half-breeds. And this a little bit of background here after King Solomon died, and we've been studying this on, on Wednesday evenings. The nation of Israel was divided into the southern kingdom of Judah with its capital in Jerusalem and the northern kingdom of Israel with its capital in Samaria. And in 722 BC, the nor- northern kingdom was taken captive to Assyria, and the Assyrians transplanted uh, different people into the northern kingdom who intermarried with the remaining Jews, and their descendants became known eventually as the Samaritans. And they were despised by the Jews from the south because they weren't pure breeds, and the Jews refused to even allow them to worship with them at Jerusalem. And so the Samaritans then went ahead and built their own rival temple in Samaria on Mount Gerizim, and they formed their own religion, sort of a mixture of Judaism with paganism, and in turn, despised the Jews who despised them. And by Jesus' day, the hatred was so intense that they wouldn't even travel <clears throat> uh, around the area. 
And there are still, by the way, in Israel today, some Samaritans. So Jesus willingly and his disciples reluctantly went right through the middle of Samaria. And this was very unusual. So he came to the city of Samaria, verse 5, which is called a city of Samaria called Shikar, near the plot of ground that Jacob and his sons, son Joseph, uh, that he gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, thus sat by the wall. And so though Jesus, he's God, he, he took on human flesh with all of its limitations, and now he's tired and thirsty. It was a good journey from Judea to the north uh, into Galilee and Samaria, and it's hot and dry, and there's not a lot of rest stops, at least they weren't then. And it's about the sixth hour, so this is 12 noon, the, the hottest part of the day. And a woman of Samaria came to draw water. And this is also something that's not typical of that hour because it was the hottest part of the day. It was high noon. And the women who came to draw water would normally come in the morning when it was cooler or in the evening uh, to avoid the heat. But why did she come now? Well, as we'll find out, probably to avoid the other women in the community. That's where they would sort of gather. But to her surprise, she was not alone. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink for me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So not only was it improper for a Jew to talk to a Samaritan, but it was also uh, not the right thing to do to talk to a woman who were considered in that time and culture to be second-class citizens. But to this, say the least, this is very shocking to this woman who had gone out of her way to avoid people. Shocking to her that a Jew would talk to her, and nonetheless a rabbi would talk to her. But I wanted to note the difference between Nicodemus, who we talked about last week, who Jesus talked with in chapter 3, and this woman in chapter 4, the contrast there. Nicodemus was a Jew and he was named. This woman's a Samaritan, no name here. Nicodemus was very religious. He was a moral person, and this woman was anything but that. She was immoral. Nicodemus was highly respected by all. This woman was despised by all. Nicodemus came to Jesus. He sought Jesus out, but Jesus sought this woman out. Nicodemus came by night, and this woman comes in the brightness of the noonday sun. And you know what that tells us? That Jesus is approachable by all of us, anyone, anytime, and anywhere. Amen. We can run into Jesus. And not only is that true, but we need to remember that when we run across people who we wouldn't normally associate with, or at times of the day that, that we're not as active as we are other times uh, there's always the time to share Christ. And in verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that said to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, what exactly is the gift of God? Well, you don't have to go very far in the context here. Uh, in fact, it's mentioned back in John chapter three, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so the gift is his son himself. And then in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Woman, if you knew who was talking to you, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus is, is a master <clears throat> at meeting people right where they are not coming off with a bunch of religious jargon, confronting people, condemning people. Why? Because back in John chapter 3, verse 17, we read last week, for God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. And in our evangelism, if, if, if a person walks away and they're condemned, we haven't done our job, but that the world through him might be saved. And so we need to take a lesson here from Jesus. He's not condescending. He's not treating other peoples as wretched sinners, though she was. He saw her, and he sees us as we really are. We're sinners in need of a Savior. We're hurting. We're lonely. We're miserable. Jesus talked to Nicodemus about his real need, that of being born again, and he talks to this woman about uh, 
who's thirsty about living water. And I thought, how wise. And so his, his, his dialogue with people wasn't the same thing every time. He wasn't slamming people. Two reasons why Jesus was able to relate to people, obviously, as God, he knew what was in man, and as man, he could relate to people. He looked past the sinner on the outside and saw the greater need on the inside, her need for forgiveness. He put it all together. Why she was there by herself in the middle of the day, it was, it was the most worst time to do that. And the woman said to him, verse 11, sir, and notice she's starting to warm up a bit. You have nothing to draw with, and, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us uh, the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? And, and the water in that particular well was known as being some of the best water around. How are you going to top that? Jesus was talking to this woman about her spiritual need, and all she could think about was her physical need. She, like Nicodemus, didn't understand what Jesus was talking about, at least at first. He answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. You know, so often the natural man thinks of only the material and temporal things of this life, like this woman, but the spiritual man thinks of the spiritual things and the eternal things. Man is a threefold being. He's body, soul, and spirit, and there's a, there's a physical thirst for sure. There's also a physical thirst for material things that can only be satisfied by the body appetites and by things, and there's a spiritual thirst that we're all aware of that can only be satisfied by God's spirit. And most people think if they have all the material things they could ever wish for, if I just had this or that, it would satisfy me or satisfy that thirst inside, but it never does. And most of us are a testimony to that. And the material goals that we set, they're never satisfied. We always want more. If we just had our own home, we'd never want anything again. I remember being there. And then a year later, it was, you know, it'd be nice as a patio. If we just had that, then we could relax. That's how the material things are. We always want more. But if we thirst for the water that this world has to offer us and drink it, we'll continue to thirst. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. She's still thinking physical and material. She, she was tired of coming to this well, tired of hiding in the heat of the noonday sun. She still didn't understand. And that's how those people are that we run into. We know because we know the Lord. They don't know yet. It takes a while to put the things together, but Jesus is going to draw her out. And Jesus said to her, go and call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. You're living in sin. But he didn't, he didn't you know, slam her, did he? In that you spoke truly. You, you've been honest. You see, there's no conversion without there first being some conviction. This woman already knew that she was a sinner. She didn't need anybody to tell her that. She knew something was wrong. She was feeling the way she was because of that. That's why she was hiding from everybody else. She knew there was a difference. And there's no conversion without confession. So we, we need convi conviction first from, from the Spirit of God, and he works so often through people, and then confession comes, and then conversion comes. And in essence, this uh, Jesus was saying, woman, before you can enjoy what I have to offer you, there needs to be repentance. And, and this was, was in, as much as was in her at this moment in time, was her confession of her sin. Before we can ever come to Jesus as Savior, we need to acknowledge our sin. We need to confess our sin. And that's what she did. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. And I noticed something else. First it was, hey, you, what are you doing here? Then it was, sir, and now prophet. Her knowledge of Jesus was expanding. And that's true of us as well, isn't it? We come just the way we are. And now that her mask had been ripped off and her sin had been exposed, she tries to get religious with Jesus. And a lot of people do that, don't they? Oh, I go to church. Yeah, I do this, I do that. All this stuff comes out. A lot of people get religious in order to take the focus off of them. And they argue religion. 
And you've heard this same thing before, you know. Uh, did Adam have a belly button? Could you answer that for me? Where did Cain get his wife or how did Noah get all those animals in the ark? I don't believe that for a moment, you know. So the woman begins arguing, our fathers, and she's talking about the Samaritans. Now, we worshiped on this mountain, Mount Gerizim. You know, we got our own temple and a whole deal, you know. And you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place that we ought to worship. Answer that, Rabbi. You guys ever heard anything like that? It's a smoke screen. Don't discount the fact that this woman had sensed the guilt, the conviction of the Holy Spirit that comes from, from the loving uh, Spirit of God. She sensed that. She already knew something was wrong. Now she's trying to throw up the smoke screen. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming, and when you will neither, neither on this mountain, that's Mount Gerizim, nor in Jerusalem, at the temple there, worship the Father. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, the worship of God's not about a location. <laughs> you worship what you don't know. The Samaritans were not clear on who they were actually worshiping. Remember, it was a, it was a mixture together of Judaism and, and paganism. And they believed in a God that was limited to a location to right there where they were, just like the pagans were. But it's not about location, is it? God is omnipresent. He's everywhere, all the time, every time. There's never a time that he's not there. And that means I can talk to a guy in Syria as well as I can talk to a guy over in Sparks. And the Lord's there. We Jews know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. And, and so the word of God came through the Jews. Uh, uh, Jesus, our Savior, is a Jew. And God's salvation has been revealed, first of all, uh, to the Jews and then through the Jews. But the hour's coming, and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. It, it's not external. It's not about a place. It's not about the ceremony and all the rituals. It's something that's in your heart between you and God. And it must be in truth, amen? It has to be according to the truth of God. We can't just make up our own religion and do whatever we want to do whenever and however we want to do it. We can't just take this and reject this from the word of God. We must worship the God of the word according to the word of God. And a lot of people, they're sincere in their worship of, of what or who they think they ought to worship, but they're sincerely wrong. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and truth or the father in spirit and truth for the father is seeking such to worship him. Did you hear that? God is seeking your and my worship. He wants you. He wants me. Another way to put it is it's not through religion. It's, it's about relationship with God. God is a spirit, verse 24, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And the woman said, I know that Messiah is coming who's called the Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And here's the interesting thing. The Samaritans absolutely believed that when the Messiah showed up, he would tell them how God was supposed to be worshipped. And that's what he's doing right here. He had just told her that God is to be worshipped in spirit and truth. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he was talking with a woman. A little upset that he was and not sure what they ought to do about it. Yet no one said, what do you seek or, or why are you talking with her? And, and the woman left her water pot. Again, you know, why did she do that? Well, one, that which was previously important to her, the water was no longer a paramount thing. And, and that happened to us when we came to Christ, didn't it? All of a sudden, what we thought was important in life was not so important. We left a lot of things behind. They're no longer important. And number two, it also meant because she left the water pot that she's coming back. She left her water pot, and it says, she went her way into the city and said to the men, and I thought to myself, why the men? Probably because the women wouldn't talk to her. Come and see. Boy, that's one of the first things that happens to us. Once we've been introduced to Jesus and we figure out who he is and we're in the process of, of learning more about him, it's so important, and it's almost like a natural thing that we want to tell somebody else. Well, tell me about it. I, I don't know much, but just come and see for yourself. Well, how simple is that? Come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? 
And here again, we see it. It, it goes from, hey, you, to sir, and to prophet, now the Messiah. And, and again, we see her faith and her trust and relationship to the Lord growing, just like ours does when we come to him. She's got a growing understanding of who Jesus is. And so will anybody who commits their life to Christ. And then they, that is these men, went out of the city and came to him. They took her advice. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. So this woman of Samaria, who's an adulteress, she learns that Jesus is the Messiah, gets all excited. She runs back to get the men of the town and, and, and bring them back so they can meet Jesus as well. And the disciples, all they're worried about is eating. Does that remind you of anybody? Don't say me. <laughs> but he said to them, I have food to eat which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, Has anyone, have you brought anything to him? What's he talking about? They still don't get it. And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Here's what he's saying. That which satisfies my soul is to do what God is wanting me to do at that moment to tell others about him. When Jesus came to the well, he sat down in exhaustion. It had been a long trip, and now he's refreshed, and now he's revived. And so the way, here's another spiritual lesson, to be revived and refreshed, the way to be renewed is to give Jesus out, is to obey what he says. And then he says something interesting to the disciples in verse 35. Do not say there are still four months and then come the harvest. And that was a common saying in the day, expressing the time period between the planting of, of a crop and then the harvesting of that crop. He says, behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And, and I believe what was happening is at this very moment, the men from Samaria were coming out of that area and they're all wearing these white turbans. That's what they did then. Jesus was talking here about the spiritual harvest. You know, and there's a tendency in this, isn't there, to think, well, the, well you know, uh, uh, I understand Harvest America's coming. That's in March. I mean, and, and, and we, sometimes we miss opportunities that are today or tomorrow or next week. Because we keep thinking it's for another day or something else. The disciples were no different than we are. We miss the opportunities that are in front of us because we're waiting for, for uh, Saturday when we go street when to sing or something. It's just, it's every day. And he's trying to tell them these things. And those in Samaria who need to know about Jesus, they're ripe to hear. That's another lesson. You know, sometimes we got an attitude after a while that, that they don't want to hear. I know this guy, I work with him, he doesn't care. You know, he shut me down before. Or look at that person over there. They look like a wretched, filthy sinner. They don't want to hear about the Lord. They're so far from the Lord. So there's so many things to. And I thought to myself, who are the Samaritans in your life? Those that you'd rather not talk to. You'd rather go all the way around. Maybe it's a guy that works next to you. You're avoiding him. Maybe it's the Muslims. Who knows? that are really open to hear, that are dying inside, that are recognizing and, and God is showing them their sin and, and, and we're not even aware of it. Who are the ones that nobody else wants to deal with? Who are the ones that are never going to hear about the Lord uh, unless you tell them because you're the one that's working there with them? And that's not to say God you know, is, 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 is out of luck if, we're, if we you know, don't do what we're supposed to do. God has other ways, believe me. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he that reaps may rejoice together. For this, is the, this saying is true. One sows and another reaps. And I sent to you to reap for that which you've not labored on. Others have labored and you've entered into their labors. The Samaritans were hungry and thirsty like this woman. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because the word of the woman who testified, he told me all things that I ever did. What a testimony. This woman is right off the, you know, right out of just being saved, if that's, you know, excited. Her life had been changed in a moment. They believed in him because of the word that the woman who testified, he told me all things that I ever did. Though she was not useful to anyone else, she was useful to the Lord, and so are you and I. She did what all new believers do. They, they don't know any better. They just tell people about the Lord. Then we get sophisticated, you know. 
You ever practice the message before you went and talked with somebody and it never happened that way? I mean, I can't even tell you the amount of times, you know. I remember it took me seven years to, to get up the courage to talk to my dad, you know. And I finally thought, man, I had rehearsed this and stuff. I'd prayed and the whole thing. It's time to, to go, you know. And I, and, and I started sharing with him. And he said, well, Tom, I'm surprised you talked to me like that. I'm a Catholic. And I go, I, I did not. I would have an answer for that one. He never went to church a day in his life that I knew of. And, and that's what happens, isn't it? We've got to go trust the Lord. That's all she did was tell the people, hey, you got to come and see. That's all she did, what, what little she knew. She didn't stop and take a course in personal evangelism. People are dying every day. That's not to say that, that we shouldn't. She introduced someone to Jesus and let him take care of it. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, much to the chagrin of his disciples, I'm sure. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. This woman who everyone avoided sparks a revival in Samaria, the place where no Jew wanted to go to. Praise the Lord. By touching the Samaritan people, Jesus was not just touching them, he was touching his own disciples. By this time, they're a little embarrassed. Boy, did we miss the boat, you know? There's no one out of the reach of salvation. The entire world is a, is a harvest, and it's ripe. And now after two days, he departed from there, and he went to Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they had also gone up to the feast. So he had an audience when he came back to Galilee. Why? Because a lot of the Galileans had gone down for the Passover. Now they'd gone back, and now they've been prepped you know so often when we share with somebody the lord's already been sharing especially if we've been praying for him and now jesus goes from an adulterous woman this samaritan to a man a nobleman of good reputation again no one you know maybe we gravitate towards those we think might listen to us and the guys in a in a three-piece suit walks by and we don't he don't want to hear this you know well that's not the case Jesus and the nobleman, now in, beginning in verse 46. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water into wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Doesn't mention his name. He could have been a Jew or Gentile, probably an official in Herod's court. But he's from Capernaum, which is on the Sea of Galilee, about 20 miles from Cana. So he had traveled 20 miles now to see Jesus. And when he, this nobleman, heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, and he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. You know, as a parent, the absolute best thing we can do is bring our children to Jesus. And, and evidently, this man had heard things about Jesus. He had, he had this much faith in Jesus He'd heard Jesus had done it before for other people. Why not me? And on top of that, he was desperate. And then Jesus said to him, and at the same time, he's, he's addressing the crowds that have been forming, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. We talked about those who were following him just because of the signs and wonders and not because of what he was saying. And the nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. He's not going to give up. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. You know, he'll never turn anyone away who's, who's genuinely interested in him and his way of salvation. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. Boy, how simple is that? No longer what is, was his faith based on what he'd heard others say about Jesus or, or, or the miracles that he'd heard that Jesus had done. Now he has a personal, one-on-one -on -one faith and based on what Jesus had said to him. Like those in Samaria who believed the woman, they came and heard for themselves and now they believed on him because of his word. And like what Jesus said to the disciples after the resurrection, remember Thomas, I'm not going to believe it till I see it with my own you know, hands and feel it with my own fingers, you know. And then, wouldn't you have loved to have been there when Jesus showed up after the resurrection evening and Thomas is there? And he said, hey, Tom, hey, reach your finger here and look at my hands and, 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 and 
put your hand, fingers into my side. He said, don't be unbelieving, but believe. And Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you've seen, you've believed me. But blessed are those who have not yet seen, yet believe. And there's a lot of people running around like that whose lives have been so devastated by this world and by sin that they're looking for any lifeline. He believed without seeing the miracle. Remember, he's 20 miles away from home. He said, go your way, your son lives. And, and, and the man believed. And then we see, and he went his way. And as he was going down, so he's traveling back to Capernaum, 20 miles from where uh, uh, Jesus, you know, he had his confrontation with Jesus. His servants met him and told him, saying, your son lives. And then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour. It's about one o'clock in the afternoon. The fever left him. You know what that tells us? He didn't take off running back home. This was the next day. And he meets those that are coming after his son had been healed, and he sort of meets them halfway. This is an action of faith. As Jesus said, your son is healed, huh, I could take my time going back now. I don't have to. Then this is faith and trust. So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus had said to him, your son lives, and he himself, listen carefully, believed, and his whole household, his whole household gets saved. He didn't immediately leave the same day. He, he trusted Jesus. The, the urgency of the situation that, that Jesus had healed him now was over. And this again, verse 54, is the second sign which Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. Two very different people. An adulterous woman, a Samaritan, she believed and told an entire town, and many believed on uh, his word. A nobleman's son believed the word of Jesus, so he hadn't seen anything as a result of it, and, and in his entire household believes. And remember why John wrote this. John 20, 31, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's what it's all about. And then the other thing we learn here is so often as Jesus is revealing himself to people, he's first of all, you know, just, hey, you, you know, the man upstairs. Uh, uh, and then it's sir. And then it's more than that, isn't it? He's a prophet. I mean, so there's something about Jesus. I'm not sure what it is. And then he's the Christ. And then eventually he's our savior. And, and that's what happened to me. Revelation is progressive. He approaches each person differently. There's no stock way to, to share our faith. And, and you know what? Sometimes we don't have a con the control over it when it happens. You might be at the DMV getting your license renewed, you know? And, and, and you've been there. You've seen the line. That's a great opportunity right there, <laughs> you know? Man, you're going to have at least 45 minutes, you know? And then I noticed something different. To, to, to Nicodemus, Jesus appealed to his mind. To the Samaritan woman, he appealed to her conscience. And to the nobleman, he appealed to his heart. Man, he was, he was torn up over the fact that his son. And so there's, there's so many different ways to approach this thing. And then to recognize that, that once he's yanked us out of the mire and put us on a rock that we're now fit to go tell others about him. That, to me, that's an amazing thing. And I think one of the biggest lies of the devil is that we, we're not equipped to tell other people about Jesus. Or, 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 or he frightens us into not wanting to say something. Has anybody here ever been afraid to tell somebody about the Lord? You know, you could tell them about anything, but it's, you mention the Lord and all of a sudden there's this fear. That's the devil. Here's, I think, what we walk away from this. If, if, you're, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you've never turned your life over to Christ, then he's willing to take you right where you're at. 
All you've got to do is place your faith and trust in him alone and not your own performance. You can't say, well, I, I don't know if he could ever forgive me. I mean, you can believe what, he, what, he, what I've done. Oh, believe it. He'll, he'll take anybody. I mean, look at us. And then for us who believe, uh, maybe what God's saying to us is, don't say this is for another time. The harvest is ripe. Uh, because I know a lot of you, I know a lot of you are going to go when you leave here and go eat somewhere. Well, maybe it's the waitress, you know? Who knows? We don't, but he does. So we go and we're ready all the time. And, 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 and the other thing we have to learn is, is that, that Jesus had to remind the disciples that, you know, if you're so worried about the earthly stuff, you know, you, all you're worried about is eating, <laughs> you know. And I'm convicted a little bit because I like to eat, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, we, sometimes we miss those opportunities, you know. We, get, we gotta, it, it isn't just about that. You know, there, there's, I think we miss some opportunities because we're not in tune with the Lord and what he's saying at times. Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful for your word and, and uh, for these encounters with, with everyday people, Lord. <clears throat> Sinners just like, like us. And thank you for the things that, that your Holy Spirit has revealed to us through this through chapter 4, Lord. Help us not to look up and think that, that uh, harvest time is, is another time, another day, another person. Help us not to go around those we'd rather not associate with and, and miss the opportunity to share Christ with somebody. And Lord, we're so thankful that you didn't go around us, Lord. You, you came right to us. You, you sent somebody to us. And then help us to do what we see here, Lord, to then go like this woman did and tell others, tell somebody to come and see. We thank you and praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand.